following interview uh, with Layson's battlefield guide, John Fuss, 76 East Broadway, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, is being conducted by Michael Strong on February 24th, 2015 at the home of John. Good morning, John. Good morning. John, I appreciate you uh, participating in the uh, oral history project for the battlefield guides. Uh, to get started, John, could, could you tell me when and where you were born? I was born on a farm just east of uh, Emmitsburg, uh, Maryland. That's where my association with the Battle of Gettysburg, you might say, began. Because it so happened that uh, part of the Union Army Third Corps camped on that farm on the uh, night of June 30th. Where, where was that farm? It's on the road between Emmitsburg and Tunnytown. In General Barney's report, he says, you know, they camped a mile east of uh, Gettysburg, the 105th Pennsylvania uh, official record states a mile east and uh, another report I forget where I just to reference but it said they camped near a stream Middle Creek it was a hundred yards from the house where I was born in and it uh, uh, was right in the middle of our farm was what were your parents names uh, my father it was John M Fuss and uh, my um, Wife's, uh, my, his wife's maiden name, my mother, was Helen Virginia Oler. So you, you, was that farm in their family for, for several generations? No. Uh, the, uh, my grandfather had purchased it uh, in the early 1900s. But my people, my ancestors, have been in this area uh, um, for the 1700s. Every one of my 16 sets of great-grandparents are listed in the 1790 census of the United States, either in, mostly in northern Frederick County and in southern Adams County. Okay. So where, where did, you, you, you told me where you were born, but what, what year was that? I was born September 26, 1930. 1930. So you were a child of the Depression, right? Child of the Depression. And, uh, do you remember? Do you remember the depression affecting your family? It affected us extensively, very much. Now, my uh, parents were certainly what you call middle class. In fact, my maternal grandfather was uh, uh, considered wealthy, and he was a director of uh, uh, a bank called Central Trust Company. Uh, and in the depression, uh, it uh, went under. And then they had stock that was uh, accessible, not that way now. So not only he died a rich man, and when he settled up his estate, uh, a couple, uh, like a year later, each one of his four daughters got uh, less than a thousand dollars. My father had followed his father-in-law's advice and bought some of the stock. Uh, after three years of farming, when I was a year and a half old, he had to uh, uh, sell his livestock, and sell the, uh, uh, his machinery, just to avoid bankruptcy, and we moved to a small place. He worked for a dollar a day for several years, and my mother worked as a domestic for less. That was in Emmitsburg? Uh, between Emmitsburg, and just east of Emmitsburg, yes. Okay. Do you, what kind of chores did you have when you were a farm boy? Do you, do you remember working on the farm? Or? <laughs> well, no. When I was four and a half, we moved to a larger farm. Okay. Uh, then uh, when I was six years old, I started to milk a cow. That's <laughs> doing my job. So I worked uh, extensively uh, all through my boyhood on a farm. We had a general farm with uh, a dozen dairy cows, a couple hundred chickens, uh, uh, raised uh, hogs, and a flock of sheep. Did you, did you have a, your dad have a car? They had a car, yes. Uh, as I said, they were pretty well off when they got married in the beginning, but uh, during the worst years there, uh, they uh, had the car no one else had money to buy it or anything like that. So to go to town, they walked in and walked out, and they carried me, they, they said, when they had to go for some necessities or something. So Emmett's, you lived closer to Emmitsburg than you did to Tawnytown, right? 
Oh, uh, just yeah, a mile or just two. a mile or two. Never more than a mile and a half from Emmonsburg. Right. Was your family Catholic? My family was Methodist. Methodist, yeah. So, in a Catholic town. I was going to say Emmitsburg with the, the colleges and it was pretty, pretty much a Catholic town, still pretty much a Catholic oh, yes, town. Oh yes, indeed. With, with being Methodist, was, did, did your father, uh, did he get along with the Catholics okay? or We got along very well with them. In fact, the neighbors on the farm where I lived, uh, I lived on, my, the farm we lived on uh, from the time I was four and a half really until I was, got married when I was 30s uh, had uh, uh, Catholic neighbors on both sides and we worked back and forth uh, and thrashing and uh, pot silo filling and all that very good yes do you remember going to any of the events at the at the colleges at Mount St. Mary's or St. Joseph's I mean uh, sporting events or anything uh, like that? yes yes especially uh, after a period of time right after I got out of the army uh, burn Weldy uh, Catholic neighbor, he was a little older than I was, but we went to most of the basketball games out there in the wintertime. At the old hangar there, right? That's yes, the <laughs> old hangar, that's right. That's right. So where did you go to school, John? I went 11 grades to Emmitsburg High School. Back then, Maryland only had 11 grades. See, we were smarter than the people in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I'd have to go 12, but we finished in 11. It was later on when they added the 12th grade. Where, where was the high school in Emmitsburg? Because there's no Emmitsburg High School now. No, it's a building that's now the library and the town office. Okay. You know, on South Seaton Avenue. So you were able to walk to school? Which, uh, no, school buses. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. There were five buses that hauled the country kids into the uh, school. I was valedictorian on my class of 28. Okay. Where, had your parents gone to, did, were they educated people? Uh, my parents both had graduated from Emmitsburg High School. Okay. My father had uh, then taken a, a business course uh, afterwards, uh, but because of the death of his uh, father in an accident, uh, he became a farmer. My mother had gone two years to uh, urban college, uh, sort of a <laughs> girl's finishing school, if you know what I mean. So in your high school days, it would have been during World War II. Huh? World War II, I graduated in 1947. Did, did, how, do you, how do you remember the, the war affecting your parents and the, your neighbors? Did people go off to war? Or? Oh, yes, yes. Well, my first cousin, much older than I was, was uh, at uh, Hickam Field uh, when in Hawaii when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Then he would participate. He would, Participated in the Battle Midway, and uh, then uh, uh, he was in the Guadalcanal com campaign. He was uh, a uh, flight engineer on a B-17 bomber that uh, didn't, re after on the 17th mission, did not uh, was damaged and didn't make it back. I remember reading that the, the Mount St. Mary's had a naval training. For training officers there at the mount. That's right. Yes. Remember, they used to have that. Used to have that gun that sat up there by the old gym. I don't know if it's still up there or not. But, uh, yes. Well, one of my second cousins, uh, three years older than I was, uh, when he uh, finished high school in 1944, he joined the navy to see the world, and he got sent to Mount St. Mary's College. <laughs> he could see his house. <laughs> from his dorm room. <laughs> Not bad duty, huh? So when, when you were growing up, with the 75th anniversary would have occurred here at, in, in Gettysburg. Did, did you remember that? or remember yeah, attending? Sure. Did you attend? Uh, uh, partially. No, we were farming, so we didn't, uh, we weren't here when uh, the, the peace light was dedicated, mm -hmm. but we were, uh, at Gettysburg for one of the parades. We were standing, uh, see I was seven years old, we were standing near the roof house and uh, uh, remember my father holding me up so I could see um, uh, you know, the veterans, most of them riding and that sort of thing going by. But then uh, a little later on, uh, people started cheering and everything. I don't know if it was the president or the governor or 
uh, who it was, but my father didn't hold me up then, so I don't know who I didn't see. <laughs> but then that night, uh, uh, there was a big demonstration, uh, uh, and we, our car was parked out along Emmitsburg Road. We were in the area there close to the Bryan house. There were searchlights going around through the sky, the Army had set up. They had um, supposedly anti-aircraft guns or something set up. They, I guess they were shooting uh, fireworks up into the air, you see. <laughs> but it was rumored or said that the Air Force planes, Air Corp planes were supposed to be coming from Langley Field in Virginia. And then they were going to mock, shoot them down, you know, and that sort of thing. But the planes never showed up, or at least not while we were there. Okay. So, but you, you actually saw, you remember seeing veterans, Civil War veterans? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Did they, did Emmitsburg do anything at that time? Did they house any of the veterans in Emmitsburg? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't recall that, that they did. But when, when you were in high school, did you, did your parents, were they encouraging you to continue your education? Oh, yes. Yes, they were. Okay. You, you then went to college. Yes, I was 16 when I graduated to see from high school, so I went for two years to um, Western Maryland College, it's okay. now called McDaniel right. College. I was majoring in science, but I wasn't really interested in, uh, uh, in uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. I had good grades, but after two years I decided not to continue. Okay, and, and then what? Then I went to work uh, for Nals Foods at the Ortana plant. Uh, it was warehousing work, uh, and uh, by the time I was 20, I was a foreman of the night shift, having 10 older men working for me, uh, you know, loading cars, stacking, uh, labeling uh, uh, cans, that sort of thing. Did you have a car that you were able to get up to Fort Town? Yes, I had a car then. Yeah, what was your, what was your car? What, what kind I of had a uh, 1949 uh, Chevrolet. Oh, so you must have bought that new, huh? I bought that new for about $1,800. Okay. <laughs> it, was it on the payment plan? Or did, or did you, were you? No, no. You, I, you paid cash, huh? I paid cash, yeah. Okay, so you were driving a new car. You were, you were king of the world, right? At 20 years old, you, had a boss, you were a boss, you had a car. <laughs> Yeah. Did you have a girlfriend at that time? Or? I had a girlfriend, yeah. Yeah, okay. But were you still living at home? Oh, I was living at home, yes. Okay. So uh, this would have been 1949. We're now. Oh, well, it, I was there from 1949 uh, to 1951 when I was drafted. Okay. So you, you were drafted into the, into the Army? Into the Army, November 1951. Okay. You remember getting that letter in the mail? Yes, I got the letter in the mail, of course. <laughs> How long did you have after you got your notification that, uh, that you had to report? Well, I had uh, taken the physical examination uh, back in September, but uh, uh, and uh, uh, a classmate who is a uh, week uh, who is two weeks older than I was, was drafted near the end of October, so I knew my turn would be in two weeks. So uh, I got a, when I got the notice, it was about 10 days to report. Okay, where, where did you report to? Port Meade, and then I took my basic training, Signal Corps, at Camp Gordon, Georgia. Okay, and this was, this was now the Korean conflict had, had broken out. The Korean conflict was well underway. Right, so you knew you were probably going to go overseas, right? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. So you were Fort Gordon? Where, where exactly was Fort Gordon? Uh, it's just outside. It was Camp Gordon. Camp Gordon. Yeah. It's a fort now. Right. Uh, its name, of course, for the general who fought here at Gettysburg. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, it uh, it's near Augusta, Georgia. Okay. So you... you how long was your training? Eight weeks of basic training. And during the latter part of uh, basic training, uh, <clears throat> uh, got word from home that I was being investigated by uh, the FBI, you see. Well, that, what was that all about? Well, <coughs> next, next I went to the message uh, uh, center school 
and then the cryptographic school, you know, that's encoding and decoding classified messages. Okay, so the, messages. So the FBI was checking your background and that's to, right, to yeah. see if you could do that. And before. about four uh, uh, later, while I was in cryptographic school, there was another set of investigators from uh, uh, nobody knew really who they were from investigating my family, my background. Did this have you worried? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think much about it. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. Fine. But the, the second investigation was to get a Q clearance. The, clue cl the Q clearance was one uh, where a very limited number of personnel uh, uh, were ever received uh, because it uh, had to do with the handling of uh, atomic uh, uh, weapon uh, technology and that sort of thing. There at the time, uh, you know, we were in the Cold War with Russia and that sort of thing. So that Q clearance, uh, uh, I, I didn't have no idea what it was about, nor did, did any of my family or anyone else know, you see. So when I finished cryptographic school, you know, that's where you learn to do secret codes and all that sort of thing. Uh, most, there are about 40 graduated every week. Practically all of the uh, 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 graduates were assigned to some overseas post, you see. Can you imagine my surprise and delight when uh, uh, there were five of us assigned to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. That was going to be great because my cousin was in the Army there, the Signal Corps. He came home to Emmonsburg every week, you see, and he told how, you know, all they did very little and all that sort of thing. So I'm overjoyed. I get to Fort Monmouth after leave. Uh, <coughs> no one seems to know where the 7131 Army unit is. Finally, uh, we were taken to a building in the back part of the, uh, no signs, back part of the base, no signs, no nothing. Looked like it was uninhabited. Went in and there was Sergeant uh, Gerald Sylvester. 7131, yes, come on in, this is it. Why were you there? Can't tell you. Next day, Captain Rodman uh, came by and he said, that uh, we were, uh, we couldn't say anything about where we were going or what we were doing, but we'd be heading to the Marshall Islands for uh, atomic uh, testing. Did you have any idea where the Marshall Islands were? Oh, I knew where the Marshall Islands were. I, I, see, we learned geography back then. <laughs> In those days, they taught geography. They don't do that anymore. Sure, okay. yeah. Did, did you have, what rank were you? <clears throat> I was private. Okay, so this all this training hadn't, Moved oh, you no, the, no, huh? Hadn't no. moved you up the ranks at all. No, right? not at all, no. Uh, but um, uh, a couple of days later, Captain Godman came back and says, I know you guys are all good or we wouldn't, you wouldn't be here and all that sort of thing. However, you don't have any real experience. So we don't really need you over there right now. So he sent us for uh, one month, 30 days, uh, temporary duty in the Pentagon where we worked in their uh, cryptographic room, you know, doing messages and that sort of thing to gain some practical experience. So when you went to Washington, where, where did they house you? Uh, we were housed at uh, uh, South Post Fort Myer. Okay. It was sort of a resi it was a place where Pentagon workers, uh, Army personnel, uh, well, all military personnel lived. Uh, Fort Myer, you know, is mm -hmm. uh, been there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, and then uh, back home for leave, then on ship, and over to Anoe Top. Where did your ship leave from? We left from uh, 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 Pittsburgh, California. You know, San Francisco. Okay. You went out there by train. Uh, I went by bus. By bus. Yeah. Okay. You see, we had uh, a delay. Uh, we got a leave of, um, of um, uh, for like 10 days to get from Fort Monmouth to out there. So uh, most of the guys flew 
But I said, I want to take a chance to see the country. So I went by Greyhound bus uh, across from Harrisburg to... By yourself? Uh, of course, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. okay. How many days did that take? It was three days. Three days. Three days and nights. Okay. How much of the country did you get to see in three days? Well, I saw everything <laughs> from uh, Harrisburg <laughs> to, uh, uh, to California. Everything. Was that the, the Lincoln Highway? The, I mean, did it go Basically. Out? Yeah. That, old, yeah. Old, 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 no, I got to see all the cities along the way. Of course, sometimes it was at night, but uh, I remember getting off in Cheyenne, Wyoming to eat, and there were the cowboys sitting up in the diner where we were eating. Did you have a camera? No, no. I didn't have a camera then. Okay, so you got to California. Did you have some time in California before the ship departed? or? Absolutely not. We were in Camp Stoneman. That was where they were sending men to Korea. It was really a hellhole. No, because uh, once you're in there, you uh, once you got in there, no one was allowed out because, of course, there were so many uh, men who didn't want to go to Korea who would uh, desert there or uh, not show up for the ship and all kinds of stuff. So, had you ever seen the ocean at this? Oh, I've been to to the Atlantic seashore a couple of times. Okay, with your family back in your. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how? Or with the cousins. Yeah. So, so you boarded the ship. Do you remember the name of the ship? Uh, David C. Shanks, USNS David C. Shanks, a transport, crew transport. Okay. So, and that was taking you to Hawaii. We went to. It was going to Hawaii. Then it was uh, dropping off at uh, Kwajalein, um, uh, Anawitak, uh, uh, Guam, and the Philippines. Okay. Did you have any idea? Of why you were going out there. I mean, you were in this, you had done the special training, and sort of the atomic oh, training. Oh, uh, oh we, we learned in Fort Monmouth that we were going there uh, for uh, atomic testing. That's all we knew. Okay. Did that have you scared? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, okay, so now you... Well, here's the thing, it's better than going to Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you arrived in the, in the Marshall Islands. Yes. Okay. And you, what kind of training did they, what, what did they prepare you for? No, no training there. No. We, I, we were there for a job. That was encoding and decoding the messages. Now, Anawitak uh, is an atoll of about 30 some uh, little islands in a uh, like the, around the crater of a volcano is what it was, uh, with about 20 miles uh, across the lagoon that was in the center. Uh, and the Anawitak Island itself was the biggest one. It was 318 acres. Uh, on one end of the island was an um, uh, uh, airfield one mile long. So uh, there are over a thousand, uh, at the peak, way over 2,000 men living in an area one half mile by uh, 100 yards wide. Ocean on one side, lagoon on the other. See, the rest of the island was for the airfield, the uh, warehouses, storage dumps, and all that sort of thing. Were these B-29s? Uh, no. Uh, the plane, uh, uh, the planes that came in there were uh, all uh, cargo. Uh, the planes uh, used for the sampling and the planes uh, uh, that, uh, that, what, that dropped the one bomb were all based in Kwajalein. Three, the Air Force was 300 um, miles away at Kwajalein Island. After all, you can only get so many men <laughs> in one area. Now, in the whole operation, it was called Ivy. There were over 11,000 uh, men involved, no women, uh, and uh, broken down between the Army, com uh, the civilian component were the scientists from Los Alamos and Livermore in California. And uh, they're the ones who constructed the bomb, put it there. Now, the very first one was a 80-ton object 
on the top of a tower 300 feet high, it would be the first detonation of a hydrogen bomb, first ever, and uh, nobody knew for sure what, what was going to happen. Now, uh, getting back to the living conditions, uh, uh, we, everybody, for a year I lived in tents, squad tents, you know. At one, uh, two, I was on three different islands when I was over there. In one case it was, uh, and on two of the islands it was a four-man tent, and the other one it was like a ten-man squad tent. Uh, so, did you experience any storms? Uh, not during the actual operation, but Typhoon Hester came through uh, after the, it was over. It was uh, winds of 135 miles an hour. What hit our island and wrecked it was uh, winds over 100 miles. Uh, for that, we were all uh, herded into uh, uh, a couple warehouses and buildings with sand bags around but the water washed from one side of the island over to the other, right across and... Pretty much right. destroyed the camp, huh? So. Destroyed the tents and everything, yes. Right. Now, what, what, what was the purpose of... You, you fellows were being used as guinea pigs, or, I mean, what, what was the purpose of all these men to witness the bomb? I mean, what... No, it wasn't to witness the bomb, it was to uh, uh, see if it would work, you see. But they it were was only theory that uh, Edwin Teller and, uh, had that uh, this will work. You see, it took basically an atomic bomb to cause enough heat to cause the ex the hydrogen bomb to explode. Right. But they were going to they were going to measure the radioactivity to fall out on on the well, radioactivity. You don't worry about that. No, no. <laughs> In fact, then they didn't. So did you, you saw that you, you saw the bomb explode. I mean, you, you witnessed this, right? Well, for the uh, actual detonation, everyone left the island, and uh, we were on board ships, uh, being assigned to the task force uh, headquarters. You know, as a cryptographer, I was on the command ship with the leading science and scientists and all that was one of the, just our small group of crypto people, because of our Q clearance, you see, that I mentioned, had a, a chance to actually look at the blast. Now, uh, the sailors on the ship and others, you know, had to turn, look the other way and all that uh, for the protection of their own eyes. Our ship, the Estes, was 32 miles uh, uh, from the detonation. Uh, and. Uh, our small group had dark glasses that you put up uh, to put uh, over your eyes, you see. You look directly at the sun, the rising sun in the morning, completely black, completely dark. At the moment of detonation, it was a huge fireball. It was, everything was red in front. That it was estimated the fireball itself was four or five miles in diameter. You were 30 miles away. We were 32 miles away. When um, it, um, uh, and the instant it happened, there was a terrible heat flash came by. It singed, wherever your hair was exposed, it singed it off. That's why that day, instead of wearing our shorts, they had us to wear uh, uh, our long khaki uniforms, and that's so I think. There were some of the scientists who had uh, mustaches <laughs> from the deck, <laughs> they disappeared in a whiff, just like, like that. At 32 miles. 32 miles, yeah. Did, did, At, did a wave come? I mean, did the boat? Well, uh, then we were told the race base for, uh, race for a wave. The sound, of course, came about two minutes later. Uh, a terrific sound from it came, uh, but uh, there was no significant uh, wave. But uh, this mushroom cloud, in a matter of a couple of minutes, was 15 miles high. Eventually, it went up and spread out over 60 miles. Uh, it completely destroyed this island a mile long. The tower was 300 feet high. It destroyed this island that was a mile long and made a crater 160 feet uh, deep.
that was the first uh, hydrogen bomb. Then uh, we're back on land within five days, and the second test was the largest atomic bomb ever uh, detonated. That came in on a B-36, I think it was, from Kwajalein. Now, we were on land that time, and that was much more terrifying than the first one, because we're on the ground, we can see the plane drop it, and it's coming. It looks like it's going to come. <laughs> oh, my God, it's coming at us. <laughs> Instead, it went five miles ahead and, and destroyed an island. But that one shook the, the coral, the ground, you know, just like everything. But there was, at that time, there was no concern about fallout or anything like that? I mean, it well, it was known that radiation was um, uh, dangerous and all from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it wasn't the same concern for the, uh, uh, I mean, there the people had been radiated, they died and that right. sort of thing. It wasn't realized that cancers and other things uh, can come from that. So I've been extremely fortunate. Uh, I'm a member of the National Association of uh, Atomic Veterans, and uh, their big push over the past 30 years has been to try to get better recognition for the veterans who have problems because they have, uh, and their statistics, different things like uh, uh, men who are exposed to um, radiation, uh, <clears throat> uh, th those who, who served in the various tests and that sort of thing have about a 30% 30 times greater chance of having certain cancers, thyroid cancers and things like that. Was there follow-up done over the years to, by the Army to, to investigate <laughs> in, any, any problem? Every four or five years I would get something, you know, from them, you know, that Congress had mandated we have to check this, you know, what's your condition and that sort of thing. But uh, the gist of the whole uh, <clears throat> Uh, veteran thing is that um, uh, the government is you know, trying to avoid it as much as they can. Right. Now, now these, these explosions, these took place in 1954? No, this is uh, 1952. 52, okay. Yes. So, so did you think that they were, I mean, was everybody excited that they were going to use these in Korea to, to end the war? Did you think that we were going to use the bomb against the Chinese or? Well, I mean, I wasn't, no, I wasn't no, involved at that. No, no but I mean, no, the no, troops no, these themselves. Are, I mean, did you think that? Well, we're we're going to. Yeah, they wouldn't. They wouldn't raise a, a hydrogen bomb on North Korea. These were for Russia or somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I, I was on three different islands uh, over there. Uh, I mean, the week after uh, Operation Ivy was finished, they started on Operation Castle. That was a bikini, another uh, 120 miles away. It had been unoccupied since the uh, tests that had radiated the area in uh, 1946. And uh, uh, they had to, it was a strictly jungle. There were only four military there and a bunch of, of um, civilian contractors, you know. When I went there, had to go by flying boat, land on the lagoon. By the time, five weeks later, they'd finished uh, at the airfield enough that the C-47 could take off, you see, and leave. So uh, uh, I spent a year over there. Uh, the largest island I was on was uh, <laughs> the one I mentioned. No, so, no leaves? You were there? You were there? None, none whatsoever. Army life, uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, seven days a week, you know, no chance to do anything else. No so recreation or no, no, so no? So I was suffering from PST. No, no beer ration or anything? <laughs> oh, they had... Uh, <laughs> Warm beer or something? <laughs> they had PX and that sort of thing, but that didn't inter interest me. But I came back, uh, I didn't realize it, but I was a nervous wreck. Well, sure, yeah. And uh, uh, so a good neighbor and good friend, Dr. Cato, uh, his, his um, house 
but was in the country right next to ours, and we were good neighbors back and forth. He told my dad, uh, take him to the woods and uh, make, uh, uh, keep him working and that sort of thing. So, well, so what year was this? This, I got out in 1953. Okay, so you're, you, were, you had a two-year two -year tour, right? The draft was the draft two years. years. Yeah, that's all, yeah. Okay, so when you were discharged, you, you came back to California by ship? Oh, no, no. I flew, at the end of one year, I flew back to, uh, to California. Okay. I had 96 days left for my two-year term. If I'd have been seven days later, they'd have discharged me right away. But because I had 90, more than 90 days, I had to serve it at Fort Meade, in Maryland, just uh, uh, with a, a signal unit that uh, 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 was supposed to uh, uh, take over for the Pen Pentagon if in a case of a destruction of the Pentagon. Well, that nation would never survive it <laughs> with the the fellows they had there. I was glad to get out of the army. <laughs> yeah. So what, what rank were you? I was I got out as a corporal. A corporal. Mm -hmm. So you came back to Emmitsburg? Yeah. I was, a, I was a, for, for the time I was over there, I was a, a, a trick chief or a ship chief uh, all the time. Um, but I came back to Emmitsburg and of course uh, uh, I worked that winter in the in the uh, in the woods, making fence posts and things like that, go over my problems. But I realized when I was over there that in our company and elsewhere, there were the other fellows that were same, my same age, who had the rank of second lieutenant and so on, all because they had just a college education. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's when I decided uh, I ought to do something. I didn't want science. So I entered Gettysburg College in um, uh, the fall of 1954. Graduated in 1956. Okay, so you would have you would have entered as a junior. Entered as a junior, yeah. I was able to transfer most of my things, but I went uh, into accounting. And the very first day in my accounting class, I knew that was what I wanted to do. Really. It You'd like numbers right, right from the get-go. So. Oh, yes. See, my father had uh, started me. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I started keeping the uh, records for the farm. He had me to uh, write down the milk checks, the uh, eggs every week, and all that sort of thing. And so, so you were an accountant before you even knew you were one. I was an accountant before I even knew one. I got a, if you want to see it afterwards, I got a very good... Uh, Thing from my age that my daughter did for me over my computer. But anyhow, what made you choose Gettysburg College as opposed to to Mount St. Mary since you were right there next door? You just, did you know someone up here? Or? No, I didn't know anyone up here. Uh, I, why? Well, because uh, Gettysburg College I understood had a better uh, business administration thing than uh, uh, than Mount St. Mary's and. Uh, Besides, uh, 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 I have good Catholic friends, but I just... Uh, right. <laughs> uh, Do you remember the tuition? Yes. Uh, Gettysburg College, $750 a year. A lot of money. Yeah, it was a lot of money, yeah. Right. But I did get, uh, uh, under the GI Bill, I think I got $60 a month or something like that for going there. But being much more mature, having gone through your army experiences, did you kind of feel out of place with, with some of the, the more frivolous students or? I, I felt I was better than they were. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so you, you'd seen the world, so. So I, I, yes. Did you live in a dorm? Oh, no, no. I lived at home. Oh, he still is. And I worked on the farm, okay. helped my father, and we yeah. made posts in the wintertime, and I worked on the farm there. So you commuted from? from oh, yeah. yeah. That's a, did you still have that 49 car? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Still had that until uh, after I graduated from college. Now, it was a much smaller school even in those days. I mean, do you remember how many students were there? I think there were 260 or 280 in, uh, uh, in my graduate, 260 some on my graduating class. 
I graduated summa cum laude and uh, was second in, second in the class. So you, you graduated in 56? In 56, yeah. So Eisenhower was president. He had his farm here in Gettysburg. Did, did you ever see Ike when you were in school? So, oh, yes, many times. Because uh, I, when I'd become over, especially when uh, he was recovering in 1955 from his heart attack, so he lived, he was out at the house, mm -hmm. and he, uh, at the farm, and he came into his office uh, here. So many times when I'd be coming over, I'd see his entourage somewhere along the, the road yeah. at, headed in. So yes. He drove right past the farm in your commute, right? You'd, you'd go past there every day, right? Sure. I came past, past. It was before there was the bypass, you see, you know, mm -hmm. there. And, uh, I, I, I saw him a number of times, yes. Did you ever get to meet him? No. No? But never met him. But you saw him? He, he I saw him, him. yes. Yeah, he was on the campus, right? I mean, he had the office at, at that time? No, no. That was this, when, he, when, he was, when he was president, his office was in the Gettysburg Hotel. Okay. Oh, wait, no, no. It was Would have been a post office. office. Yes, the post, post office. office. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Post office, but the press corps and uh, the staff and everything, a lot of them were down in the Gettysburg Hotel. Okay. So you graduated in 56. You have a degree in accounting. Did you have yep. a job lined up? I had lots of jobs lined up. Uh, see, I was a prime uh, candidate. You okay. know, good, good grades, a veteran, you yeah. know, didn't have military service pets and you know, all that sort of thing. So you were being recruited. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I had. Uh, uh, a number of offers, U.S. Steel from uh, DuPont and a number of other big corporations. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the top anybody was offered was $425 a month. And uh, But uh, my accounting professor, Paul Baird, recommended I go into public accounting. So I took a lesser job, $375 a month, was Arthur Anderson and Company, you know, the leading accounting firm at the time. Where, where was that? Where In the Philadelphia office. Philadelphia, okay. Yeah. So you moved to Philadelphia? No, I didn't really move to Philadelphia. Oh. <laughs> okay. I considered Emmitsburg, Maryland still my home. Okay. Uh, but uh, there were, uh, I was with Arthur Anderson for five years and uh, uh, during that time, I uh, lived at three different places, but always with, it, with uh, other Arthur Anderson men. You know, we, uh, it was mostly single men, you know, that started, and uh, uh, we ran it uh, together. But I had a very good career there. So this takes you up to, what, 1959, 1960? Uh, I was there for... 1956 to 1961. Okay. Now maybe I'm sounding too uh, <laughs> self-praising or something, but uh, I went. I happened to go there at a very opportune time because uh, Arthur Anderson was expanding. It had offices all over the world at the time. It's the same firm, you know, that got uh, uh, disembarred and everything about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, with that Enron right. case. Now, of course, that subsequently was thrown out, but up to that time, Arthur Anderson was the leading uh, firm. Uh, it wasn't the biggest back then, but uh, we were the, um, uh, the mavericks out in front, you know, <laughs> pushing things and all that. Well, I uh, uh, started in 1956. There are five levels that you have in a public accounting firm. Start as a staffman, become a semi-senior, normally in two or three years. And then the next step is senior, generally four or five years. Then beyond that, you become a manager and then finally a partner at the top. Well, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, after the first, uh, uh, at the end of the first year, I was made a semi-senior. Boy, that was great. Was I ever surprised when the next year I was made senior, which meant I would be in charge of the audits, you know, out in the in, in the 
in the field, you know, with the staff men under me. The partner, uh, <clears throat> when he told me that, he said, there's no one else in this whole firm that has made it in such a short period of time. Of course, it's because uh, of the rapid expansion. When I started, there were 25 staff men at all levels. Staff men, of course, you know, women were not. Right. You can't put this. <laughs> no, but that was the, that was the time. You know. It was strictly men. Women, you know, were clerks and uh, uh, typists and things like that. Now, 25 professionals. Five years later, there were 130 uh, professionals. So you can see the rapid growth we had. And they assign you a territory? No, no. Yeah. Okay. No, no, you're given uh, audit assignments. Okay. You go to different clients. And from the Philadelphia office, I had, uh, I was on uh, from Wilkes-Barre in that area. I was out of Pitts in the Pittsburgh area until they opened our office uh, as far south as um, Suffolk, Virginia, you know, south of Norfolk. So I was in all that area. Okay, so here we are, I, the second half of the tape. Okay, I was glad to get the, the out-of-town assignments because uh, living on an expense account, you see, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I would, uh, there was one period of time when I, on a special uh, uh, local office audit, when I was, the last year I was with Arthur Anderson, I, from June, from the, uh, Beginning of May to the 1st of October, I was never in the apartment I was sharing <laughs> in Philadelphia because I was up at Wilkes-Barre. I come directly home rather than go down there, you see. When I came home I, on Saturday, I'd work on the farm and uh, get my exercise uh, that way, you see, help my dad <laughs> as well. So uh, why did I leave Arthur Anderson after such a good thing? Well, as uh, it was uh, been said, I wanted to get a wife. <laughs> I was just, I, I wanted, I was being successful in business, but uh, there was no way you can get married, you know, with, uh, uh, with uh, when you're traveling. And it's very demanding in public accounting because especially in the winter, after the end of the year, you know, you work 12, 15 hours a day and all that sort of thing, a lot of travel and all that. So I did, it worked out uh, that uh, I was uh, able, well, in fact, to get Gettysburg into the, into the uh, situation in uh, early uh, 1960, uh, one of our clients in Massachusetts had bought the Keystone Ridgeway uh, or buying the Keystone Wedgeway plant. It's a power plant. You know, the one out on York Road mm -hmm. and over here on 4th Street and had one up in Bendersville. So I was out here for two days uh, for the purchase investigation, you know, to check it out, to see if the books are right and all that sort of thing. And I met the local accountant from down in York who was their auditor. So we got to talking about things and that led to a couple of months later, he called me and said there was a position that uh, someone was looking for a controller that I'd be interested. It's in New York area, he said. Well, make a long story short, uh, uh, it was Hanover Shoe, so uh, I accepted the position with them, wound up my audits by February of, at the end of February 1961, and moved to, uh, to, um, uh, Hanover to work. Okay. Still consider my parents' farm my home, you see. Uh, so uh, it's a, a good Dr. Cato, our next door neighbor, uh, said uh, uh, he, I've been doing his tax returns uh, since I was in college and uh, good neighbors and all that sort of thing. So his daughter, uh, is Bill is married to Bill Lauer, 
of Boyer Orchards. And the, uh, uh, Dr. Cato's grandson is in second grade at Orangeville High School, Orangeville School. And he knows my situation. He talks to his daughter, and uh, his daughter's uh, son, uh, son's uh, teacher is a uh, Miss Rice. Uh, and uh, so she talked to uh, Miss Rice, and Dr. Cale talked to me. We think you two might, uh, <laughs> <laughs> might be interested in each other. So we had our first date in June 2nd, 1961, and 15 months later we were married. Okay, he's a matchmaker there. <laughs> <laughs> Very helpful, yes. Right, so oh, he's spending too much time on it. No, no, this is good. So, okay. so you married a teacher. I married a teacher. Uh, right. Couldn't have found a better woman uh, right. anywhere. Well, Sarah, was a, she was an elementary teacher, right? She taught five years, second grade, yes. Yeah, well, where did she do her education? Uh, Sarah uh, graduated from uh, Penn State University. Oh, from Penn State, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I was fortunate enough to know Sarah when we were at the Historical Society together. So you were, were you interested in history at this time? And, you know, being so busy with the accounting and the farming, did you, did you have an interest in, in the battle or, you know, just... Always had a history, uh, interest in history. In fact, I gave my first tour to Gettysburg Battlefield. Uh, I, it was right after I got out of the Army, that, I think that first year. Okay. So just some friends or? Well, my cousin was a farmer and they had an exchange, the United States government had an exchange uh, uh, program with other governments. And there was a farmer from India that was spending a couple weeks with him on his dairy farm. And this Indian said he wanted to see the, bat the Gettysburg battlefield. He says, Johnny, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Won't you take him over? So I took this Indian around and gave <laughs> him a tour. Your first tour, huh? <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, while I was with uh, Arthur Anderson, uh, uh, of course, a lot of associates, friends, and that sort of thing, uh, there must have been seven or eight different, probably ten different times over that five-year period when uh, a partner or uh, some staff man or someone came out to uh, Gettysburg and I showed him around over the battlefield. Johnny would take him over to my parents' home uh, for dinner afterwards and that sort of thing. I want to hear the most <laughs> memorable story about that. One was Bart Carter. He started the year after I did and we worked together in a couple of jobs. He was from Alabama and his mother had been the, or was, the, had been the regent for the Daughters of the Confederacy, for the whole state. Now, Bart had gone to the, uh, had been in the Navy, uh, and stationed at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and he married an Italian <laughs> woman, you see. He went back to, uh, got his education after being in the Navy at, uh, University of Alabama. When he interviewed, uh, they, with, he was accepted by Arthur Anderson, and his wife wanted to come back to Philadelphia. So they're at Philadelphia, you see. So uh, this uh, mother is coming uh, up, and she brings along her uh, cousin. Now her cousin's father had been in um, a Georgia unit, and he was in the peach orchard. and. Uh, she had never been here, so I showed him around over the, over the battlefield. Uh, so when uh, it was near the uh, end, I happened to make the mistake by saying, uh, so General Lee had to retreat uh, back. <laughs> well, that was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> so Mrs. Carter said, that's not right, that's not right. Well, I said, well, what happened, you know? Well, we come up here, we beat those Yankees, and then we went back to Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> we threw gracefully, right? Oh, but that, uh, Mrs. Carter had a four-poster bed that was to be become Bart's, or one of her children's. The only trouble was that 
Fort Coaster bed was not permitted to cross the Mason and Dixon line. <laughs> Uh, at this time, did you did you have any thoughts of maybe being a part-time guy? No, no, no not at all. You're no, involved no. in your career. I had a very good career with the Hanover Shoe for 16 years. We were the Hanover Shoe, an independent company operating on the um, on the New York Stock on the American Stock Exchange. Uh, but in 1977, uh, the business was sold. It was primarily a, bid, a family business. And the, none of the Myers family or the Shepherd family were uh, still involved. They wanted to diversify, which is a very good thing, the way shoe manufacturing went. And uh, the, uh, they sold the C&J Clark. That was a big plus for me because it got my boss out of there. He went, uh, and so then I uh, was with C&J Clark uh, for uh, 16 more years and was um, retired as the chief financial officer. Right. It was a rather tumultuous kind of uh, uh, situation because uh, 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 the English were demanding the shoe industry is uh, as manufacturing, which we primarily were, was on the decline with the imports taking over and all that sort of thing. Right. Now, when you started in Hanover, that was, we were approaching the centennial of the Civil War, and that's when my father, when, our, when we moved to Pennsylvania, yeah. my father was the plant manager of the, the Hanover Industries, which was located there in, in Hanover. There was bedspread and, and oh, really? drapery. Well, that was right almost across the street there. Exactly. We probably, we probably sat next to each other at the old spot restaurant there. At the, Oh, sure. In the, in the summertime, I was in high school, and I, I used to work there at the factory. Yeah, well, we lived in York, and, and a man named Ephraim uh, Young owned the company, and he hired my father, who was in the textile business, to be the manager there. So, so we used to go into Hanover, and I remember being there for the uh, the hundredth anniversary of the Battle of Hanover. Oh, I was too. Do you remember the? T t tell me what you remember about that. Do you remember, I remember the street fighting and the... Well, f f well I remember uh, uh, mostly the big parade of the day before. Well, our office, the Hanover Shoe, was 118 Carlisle Street, just sort of like the reviewing stand. So, of course, I had a prime place there. My parents were there, and, uh, uh, too. And uh, Sam Kilpatrick played Jeb Stewart. I knew Sam. <laughs> When he came up the street there, right in front of us, you know, he's coming, you know. Uh, he swings his horse around, he waves his hat, and he pulls the reins, and the <laughs> horse stands up on his back feet, and the crowd went wild. <laughs> yeah, he was a very colorful individual. So. Yes, he was. And he's the one who delivered uh, uh, my three daughters. Really? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you, you remember the, the reenactment in the, the square when they had the... Uh, I I saw part of that. I went to church in the morning and then headed right to, right in, and I just saw the tail end of that part. Yes. Okay. Did you participate or uh, witness the reenactment in Gettysburg for the hundred? Uh, no, I wasn't up there for that. Okay. Uh, see, the uh, the trouble was um, we uh, we had two big crush times, one right after the end of December and one after end of June. So I was not really, uh, couldn't get away to do things like that. Okay, so all during this time, of course, you're, you're busy with your, your, you know, your, your job and you had three children and, yeah. and your, your children were all educated in, in Hanover. You went to no, the, Southwestern. Oh, Southwestern, okay. School, that was yeah. a new school district at that time, right? Well, it's over 50 years old now. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was but, relatively new. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was the suburbs were happening in Hanover and things were changing, right? Yeah, so. So as, you, as your career wound down, were you now thinking about being a guide? I mean, no. Did, no? So how did, how did that come about? <laughs> well, uh, uh, well I, I did guiding some while I was um, uh, working for the Hanover Shoe and Clark uh, because every other year we'd have a, a sales conference uh, where uh, uh, all our store salesmen 
and our district managers, about 300 uh, people, would come in. They generally were held out here at the Eisenhower uh, Center south of town. Uh, when it would be a couple of days of uh, talking about new styles, procedures, and I'd talk to them about procedures, you know, handling cash and things like that. And there would always be an afternoon when it would be free time. They could stay in the motel and read a book, they could go swimming, they could go golfing, but most years they'd uh, hire a bus and I'd come up to, and I'd bring them up to the Gettysburg Battlefield to go around. Of course, I did always check with John Andrews, you know, or someone to say I was going to do it, you know, it's legal and all that. Sure, yes, you can do it as long as you're not getting paid for it. Well, I'm getting my salary for it, but I'm not getting a fee for giving the tour. So I, I, I was doing that. Uh, but uh, uh, I retired early because of the, um, and that led to my early guiding, because um, of the changes in the company. Uh, the uh, business was being transitioned to Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania, because Jan Clark, uh, you know, one of the Clark family and a big stockholder, wanted to live down there rather than in Hanover. So he gradually was moving all the different functions down there. So uh, for the last six years, uh, my accounting department, um, uh, about 40 people, uh, or supervisors reporting to me, were all in Hanover. But my boss and the rest of the uh, management was down in Kenneth Square. So I was uh, like commuting to Kenneth Square about half the days. Um, go down there for meetings and conferences and other things. So it meant leaving the house at quarter six, getting, uh, leaving down there at uh, 5.30 or so, driving back to Hanover and often working uh, in my office in the evening. But uh, uh, so, uh, about half, so about half the year, I was driving in, in the dark. Now Route 30 isn't so bad, but that Route 41 <laughs> is a bad road. And I'm 60, some early 60s, and I feel that uh, 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 I'm going to have a heart attack or a stroke or something like that if I keep this up. So I finally resolved in the, um, uh, Sarah and I talked about it, and in the summer of, eight, of 1991, I resolved uh, this is going to be my last year. So I uh, went to the company president uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, first of October and said, I want to retire. I said, I'll finish out the, the year if you want me to. Uh, uh, I'll step aside right away, but I would like to really work to the end of the year to get a full year for the pension. All oh, we can't be uh, done by then. So I finally, uh, last day was May uh, 7th, <laughs> you know, eight months after I had uh, <laughs> indicated retirement on the last day. Uh, but by that time, I had to transition everything except payroll to Kenneth Square. So a result, a lot of people who worked for me for a long time had, uh, uh, had a couple of them got jobs elsewhere in the company that was remaining there. Most of them lost their jobs, but it was the best decision they all say they ever made. Because what happened was, uh, less than a year after that, the company president, who was a good guy, good friend and all that sort of thing, moved back to, was called back to England, and he, <clears throat> and he was replaced by the head of manufacturing, who was an, an you know, what kind. He would have, uh, he wouldn't have given severance packages and all that sort of thing. So I was very fortunate to get out when I did. However, they asked me to stay on the pension committee. So I remained on the pension committee and the trustee of the pension committee uh, for another uh, 18 years. So finally, uh, in, uh, when I reached my 80th birthday, we were having the meeting two days after that. Now these pension meetings were quarterly 
most of them up in Boston, where the headquarters had been moved <laughs> to then. Well, uh, uh, I uh, told uh, the president of the company, you know, at you know, often meeting, they'd be all day meetings, and I said, before we're finished, I want to have a, a little say right at the end. So I told him, I said, uh, I want to resign. I'm going to resign because I'm 80. John, you can't do that. He adjourned the meeting. He said, recess the meeting. And he said, I got to negotiate with John. <laughs> Come on, John. He says, we, we need you. You know, we want you to go. I said, no, I made up my mind. I don't want to. Uh, I think it's time for me to step aside. But I would uh, like to make my resignation uh, at the end of February instead of right now, because then that would mean 50 years that I've uh, uh, been with the business. So he called a meeting back and says, I've tried to negotiate with John, but he won't. But we're going to have one more meeting with him. It'll be in Hanover. <laughs> so they honored me down at the Shepherd Mansion and a holiday and all that. Now getting back to guiding, though, in, uh, I hadn't given any serious thought to guiding. But uh, uh, Sarah pointed out, I think it was in July, that... Um, um, uh, you know, that they're giving the guide test in early December. Don't you think you'd like to do that? I feel sure she was certain I wouldn't be satisfied around home all the time. <laughs> well, okay, maybe. But how am I going to, I don't have any time to study for it, you see. So, uh, uh, well, that's, that's a good idea. I took the test uh, in December, um, that was in 1991, with the thought that if uh, I'll learn what it's about, then uh, I'll get the feel for it. I'll have two years, you know, till they give or so till I give it again. Then I will uh, uh, will uh, be ready to uh, uh, to start guiding. Uh, so something else miraculously happened. It just so happened that for Father's Day, my one daughter had given me a, a gift certificate uh, at um, a bookstore down in Hanover. And uh, uh, I didn't know what to get. I went looking around and looking, and here I saw this book about Gettysburg. It happened to be written by Coddington. Uh, so <laughs> I had bought this book, and here, uh, uh, when I talked to John Andrews, what he you study? He told me about Coddington. Here I had the book. I spent the, the time I spent the most time studying for the exam was um, uh, one day when I had to fly out to Detroit for court proceedings. Uh, uh, one of our suppliers was in bankruptcy and I had to go out to represent our country, company. So I uh, waited in the airport, uh, you know, from five o'clock or something to at uh, six, I uh, read on the plane, uh, uh, read out there, waited for the start, and read at home. So that was my biggest day of studying. But I finished, uh, but I, then I took the exam, and I felt it was pretty easy. Uh, so then the next problem that came up is, you know, I went, of course, to the uh, orientation in February, and then John Andrews wanted me to come to take the oral, because I'd finished number three in the and for full time, you know, then they you indicated whether you wanted full time or part time or whatever. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm winding uh, down my uh, business, you know, transferring things and everything like that. He wants me to come to give the oral, so I, I took it <laughs> with Gary Cross. The first day it was snowing like everything. You know, when we got at the uh, Moomisburg Road, you couldn't see the peace light. So <laughs> they told me, uh, you did all right, you know. So it was Gary Cross and who was, who was the and John Andrews. And John Andrews. Yeah. So uh, uh, then I uh, went back again in um, early, in the middle of April, uh, mid early April, and uh, I, I passed it then. And by the time my final um, day, my final day of work 
for Clark had already given eight tours on two weekends. And so the day afterwards, I was guiding. I've been so guiding ever since. You're off and running. Yeah. Do you remember your first official tour, since you had already been guiding unofficially for, for a number of years? Yeah, it was a, an attorney from New York, uh, uh, from Rochester, New York, man and woman, an attorney, and uh, 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 two young boys. You know, I was surprised he gave me a tip afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> this looked like a pretty good, uh, pretty yeah. good decision that you made, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you became active in the guide association right from the beginning. You were, oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, you hold, held some offices over the years? Oh yes, I was an executive council for, for five or six terms. Who was our president at that time? The president was Fred Hawthorne. Fred Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. Do you remember some of the older guides when you became a uh, guide? Oh, sure, yes. Yeah. Maybe. Hans Hensel and Bill Ridinger, you know, we mentioned before. Of course, Charlie Hathaway, uh, John O'Brien, uh, oh, uh, what was it, Lou Kinder? Mm -hmm. uh, Les, yeah, Les uh, Kinder. Uh, yeah, and uh, a lot more, yes. Did you consider any of them the mentors or? What? Did, 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 were any of them your mentors in a way that you, you kind of relied on them or you just... No, no, no were, I didn't. They, they were just your peers. <laughs> no, no, really. I'll tell you, I, uh, I, in my first guiding, you know, I treated all these others as respect. And for the first year, I never, uh, uh, like, went into the angle, you know, the angle part. I stayed over, you know, near the... Uh, the uh, cups of trees, you know, and that sort of thing. I didn't feel I wanted to be over there and uh, interfere with the, the, uh, with them. And of course, you know, and the same was true if it was at the North Carolina Mount or anywhere. I I treated, I felt they were it. They were, and I just knew. <laughs> yeah. So when you when you became a guide, when you walked in, you remember the old guide room. Of course, sir. Sure. Upstairs, do you remember your first, your first day walking in there? Uh, well, I, no. Uh, for the first uh, four or five days, uh, I, I started guiding right away. But I didn't come up till about nine or ten o'clock. You know, I didn't want to be in the draw. I didn't want to interfere with them. And someone, I've, I'm not sure if it was Hans or someone, said, "Well, John, why don't you come up and uh, join in with us?" You know. And help us cut the cards. <laughs> did, did you have a sp specific interest on the battle? I mean, is there certain areas that you prefer talking about or showing people? Or no. Well, uh, if you want to talk about guiding itself, I'm uh, don't I'm dismayed that uh, uh, a lot of guides don't show the whole battlefield. I feel that uh, every tour should cover Culp's Hill as well, and I also feel we ought to uh, follow, uh, when I say I give the John Andrews tour, because I always go down the, um, uh, past the Alabama Monument. I go out the first day, of course, uh, uh, across to Carlisle Pike and through the town to show the retreat back. Down the Confederate line, I get out at the North Carolina line because I feel that's the best place to set up for the second and third day and show the whole battle lines for the second and third day. Then I go past the Alabama Monument, a little round top, Devil's Den, and uh, uh, back, back out and across. And I always get, I get Culp's Hill on at least 95% uh, of my tours. There are some times when you can't and the people have other obligations the roads are closed uh, or some other reason but I feel uh, we're doing a disservice if we do not uh, uh, cover all parts of the battlefield now it's true you can't be as as, um, as uh, maybe as complete or as extensive for some of the other parts but I think all parts should be treated equally and when you come off of the round top, how do you transition over to Culp's Hill? Do you use Granite Schoolhouse, or how do you No, work? no, no, no. Uh, I'll come off of Culp's Hill, 
I will go to uh, I go to uh, uh, down Crawford Devil's Den Wheatfield over and uh, I talk about the Cross Hill action at the Pennsylvania Monument do the uh, uh, angle and then go over to Cross Hill and end up over there unless uh, unless I have plenty of time I much prefer especially on the three hour tour I always go over to Cross Hill from the Pennsylvania Monument. Okay. Yeah. okay. And over Grant Grant School, yes. Mm -hmm. So you'll wind on a two hour tour you'll, you'll finish coming off the of Cops Hill. Maybe. Yes, that's right. I don't like that, but uh but at least they've <laughs> seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But for the time, you know, the time factor, you know, when we were over at the other building, it was just easy to end up <laughs> at the angle and what yeah. Much easier, yeah. Do you have any memorable tours? Any celebrities or? Have a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to know the total number of tours I've done? <laughs> well, I know that you, you, you usually lead the pack. That, uh, yeah. Can I give that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, as of the end of December 14, I've done 16,369 tours. I've had 173,109 visitors during that. Uh, the most people in the year was 10,400. 21 in the year 2013 of course that was because it did 213 buses <laughs> that year uh, I had more tours this past year a few more but not but 30 less buses so that doesn't count up as uh, much the most tours I've ever done in a year was 2002 836 that was because I thought that was going to be my last year my hearing I have I lost uh, all the hearing in one year in uh, October 1999 I only had 40 percent in the other one so I'm at a great handicap I'm really a handicapped person you see and I thought my hearing was uh, going down in uh, uh, that year so I thought I'm going to do all I can and then I'll quit but I thought I'm just you're still plugging away so. <laughs> still plugging away yeah no, that's right right any celebrities over the years that uh Celebrities? Well, uh, well, every visitor is a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> They're all special. That's for They're sure. all special. No, what I especially enjoy doing it, it would be tours with people who have ancestors here. I always ask at the beginning of um, with a car tour before we get out of the visitor center, or at the beginning of bus tour somewhere. I ask anyone have an ancestor. Now, of course. Uh, you get a lot of these, especially with the school kids whose yes ancestor was in the first world, in the second world war or something, you know. Right. Where you have the people that Robert E. Lee, you know, you know about those, of course. Uh, but but uh, uh, if I have a, someone who has a legitimate ancestor, I want to give them special attention. For um, and uh, last, generally it's almost ten percent of my tours have someone. Who has an ancestor here and so what I do with them of course is take them talk about that unit and all that sort of thing then I ask them if they have uh, 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 a lot of material about the unit most cases they say no so I'll offer then to send them the OR or any articles I have and what's on the monument and things uh, mm -hmm. uh, things like that mm -hmm. you know people ask for specific uh, books to that, that you would recommend? Uh, oh, sometimes, yes. You have favorites that, that you... Well, I always say that the uh, most authoritative one is the one uh, over 30 years ago by Coddington. I say it's most authoritative because that's the one that has the right answers in for, for the guide test. If someone asks me uh, for... But I say if you want something just about the Civil, about the Civil War, I would... Uh, suggest uh, McPherson's uh, Battle Cry of Freedom because that's only about one-third about the battles it's also about the social political economic and other uh, factors that uh, uh, caused the Civil War to be fought the way it was see we just lost Harry Fonz did, did, did you know did you know Harry when he was at the park no no I, he was never here when I was here okay I didn't know if maybe he was doing over the years that, uh, no no now, along with your guiding, I, I know that you were very active at the Historical Society. But is that something, I, I failed to ask, when you moved, after you retired, you 
you and Sarah decided to move to Gettysburg. Right? Well, after I retired, uh, we continued to live in Hanover until um, uh, 1999. That was the year when my youngest daughter got married, and she considered that sort of as her home, even though she lived in the Richmond, uh, Virginia area for um, almost 10 years. But what we, the bigger house we had was uh, 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 was more than we needed. Sarah had been uh, volunteering at the Historical Society two or three days a week uh, throughout the year, and I was up here at Gettysburg, uh, except in the wintertime most days, so it only made more sense for us to get rid of the bigger house and buy a smaller house, the one we're in right now. Much easier commute, right? <laughs> yeah, it's much easier because I can easily go in, get in the draw, if I'm way down, come home, do something else. Yeah. You're asking about... So you, so you became active at the Historical Society, and you, you were a volunteer there, I mean, you were... You were, were you well, uh, I volunteer only that I'm chairman of the Finance Committee and work with Ben and all that sort of uh, thing, but uh, we both were life members for 30-some years or so, I guess. Okay. We're asking about uh, special tours or something like right, that. Right, you know, just... <laughs> okay. Well, I, I categorize them in a couple of different ways. <laughs> the most amusing tour, I think, was about 15 years ago. It was a man in a Model T Ford. You know, I think it was 1919, I think. <laughs> it uh, hand-cranked, you know, and uh, uh, open you know, completely open, you know, man, his wife, and two children. So we get, uh, I'm obviously not offering to drive that thing. <laughs> so he, he starts out. It soon has become apparent that he does not interested in the battle at all. All he's interested in is showing off his car. Because every time we came to somebody, he had a squeeze like horn. Beep, beep, you know. <laughs> if I look around, Take his hat off like that. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I was trying to give the tour for about 15 minutes, but he was only looking for people to show off. So I just played along with him, you know. I laughed too, you know, and threw up my hands, and uh, uh, it got embarrassing because we were at the, as we went around the uh, uh, Virginia Memorial, uh, here's a ranger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a big attention giver. Yeah, you see. See, beep, 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 you know. <laughs> well, the ranger got me like that. Like, oh, so he was laughing too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most challenging tour I ever had was uh, with Joe Martin, a newspaper reporter from the uh, Baltimore Sun, who retired to Hanover. He, um, uh, uh, and he came there, he volunteered at the Hanover Area Historical Society where Sarah was president. And so he, he helped with the publicity and all that sort of thing. And he also read, um, um, he also wrote a column every week for the Evening Sun. It, um, uh, and he, he would go to uh, public meetings, uh, town council meetings, school board meetings, and everything, and give his comments. Not always favorable, as you can see. <laughs> so he came up here when they were having the general management plan. Uh, and um, he um, uh, and he wrote an article in the newspaper, Hanover paper, condemning uh, the Park Service, cutting down trees. You know, the whole big thing, big long column. So I called Joe and said I was a god, yeah, I know you are, and started to explain, well, he didn't want to hear any part of that. So uh, uh, I said, have you ever had a tour of Gettysburg? Sure, sure, I've been up there. Been with a guide? No. no. Well, let me come up, let me uh, show you around. Uh, and, well, okay, bring your wife. He came, was leaving the visitor center, he says, John, I'm coming just out of respect for you and Sarah. You're not going to change my mind about the trees. <laughs> so I go around, you know, I point out uh, 
how, what parts were open. I point out uh, at the Texas Monument, you know, how it was solid trees from the Bushman farm all the way over. Point out from Little Round Top, it was um, the, um, uh, the uh, view, you know, the, the tree, it was before the guides cut down the trees, you know, on Little Round Top. You couldn't even hardly see Devil's Den or anything. Right, right. And then I told him, down at the Smith's Battery, I told him, uh, now this man from Texas who had an ancestor here can't understand why I would allow trees to be here where his, his ancestor fought across. Uh, about a week later, there was a letter in the uh, Gettysburg paper saying uh, who he was. I was critical of the Park Service in another uh, in an article in another newspaper, but a licensed guide showed me around over the battlefield, and I can see why we need to move the retreats. Okay. I thought that was a tough one. Well, yeah, but that was good. You, you, you convinced him, and uh, what that he had enough. Uh, Gumption to admit that he oh, was wrong. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. Acknowledge it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I've um, had a tough tour one time with a man from Ohio. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, it was a man, his wife, and two children, two young sons, maybe ten, twelve or so. We started out, and uh, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> we got out on the Stone Avenue, and he was saying, uh, uh, well, John, you seem to know so much, but all you're talking about is the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about yourself. <laughs> well, uh, he became more belligerent as we went along, uh, you know. Oh, I knew I wasn't getting to with him. We got the North Carolina Monument, you know. He didn't seem at all interested uh, in uh, in it at all, you know. So I said, sir, uh, look, I don't think we're getting along very well. We'll just go back to the visitor center and I'll be, uh, it won't be any charge. You know, that was at the old visitor center. Uh, well, okay, okay. So I said, if you'd like, when I pass some things, I'll ju just say something to the boy, for the boys. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I just said what the Pennsylvania mine was, the Florida monument. Got back, coming up close to visitor center. Say, John, you know, you're pretty interesting. <laughs> oh, oh, I said, uh, the boys, I think, are enjoying it. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, do you want to resume the tour? Yes, if you don't mind. <laughs> so I went back out and resumed the tour. Fortunately, it was like the last tour of the day, you know, and uh, so I was able to uh, to, do, to do that. Uh, I uh, so I had. Um, it's always interesting. That's for sure. Very interesting. You, yeah. You never know. Mm -hmm. I think I told you one time about the the doctor and his son, who was a doctor. That all they wanted to do was see the Eisenhower farm yeah and I said well why don't you get to get the bus and they'll, they'll take you out there and he goes no no we just want to see where it is we only have an hour and I said well I really can't take you back there but I can show you where it is you know? so he said well before we get started we need to stop at McDonald's and, and I said okay and I thought they were going to go in for a cup of coffee well they went in and ate and left me in the car and it's only an hour tour <laughs> So they came out with their, had their coffee, and they, after about 20 minutes or so, and they got in the car, and I drove them down Emmitsburg Road and showed them where the farm was. And, and as we're coming back up to the Emmitsburg Road, uh, there's only like 10 or 15 minutes left in the one hour that he said he wanted. He said, what are all these cannons and what are all these monuments for? <laughs> I said, well, there was a battle here, the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, he said, I, did, I, he said, I didn't know anything about this. <laughs> I said, well, that's why we're here, to give you a tour. He said, well, I don't have time, but he says, i got to come back and see this thing. So I took him back, and he, he gave me $100 and told me he'd, he'd come back to Gettysburg. <laughs> the strangest tour I ever had. But yeah. So you, you just never know. And yeah. it's, it's what makes it fascinating. Along that same subject, it was just last, well, I guess it's two years ago now, I had a tour. It was uh, uh, 
three, uh, four men, three from Indonesia, and the uh, driver was an Indonesian, evidently, from the embassy. So uh, we, uh, I asked him, uh, you know, to start going out, uh, uh, anything, uh, I shouldn't have asked him that, I guess, because they were from Indonesia. I said, anything special you want to do? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we want to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Okay, because it was one o'clock and they hadn't eaten. So they go there, they get this big bucket of chicken, you know, <laughs> big bucket of chicken, you know, like 30 pieces or something, and they pass it around from one to another. Now they didn't, you know, when I eat chicken, I normally take it and bite it off and all that. They ate it, everyone pulled off a piece and put it in his mouth, pulled off a piece and put it in his mouth, cleaned it down to the fun that way. <laughs> Yeah. What else? You, know, you just you never you never know. Have you had any military groups? Oh yes, yes, I've done some of those. Yeah. Yeah. I do not do not want to specialize in uh, those like Tony and uh, Tom and Tom yeah. Bosser and others do. But when I get them, I do them. Yeah, more like a staff ride type of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So your in intent is to to keep guiding. Hopefully, or you've got your health, so you're <laughs> well. I don't know how much longer a uh, guide. All I can say is that when I know a lot, I do not intend to be walking around with a cane <laughs> like uh, uh, we have some people doing. When I no longer can uh, uh, guide um, um, six, successfully, I think I'll just uh, I'll just stop because I think I've done enough. Well, you've, you've been given the superintendent's award for excellence, so. Uh yeah, so obviously you're still giving a good tour. And, and well, I enjoy it, yes, I, I think so.